There is something I need if I am to rule Mandalore, something that was once mine. They know where it is, and soon so will I. Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. This is going to be my new Mandalorian Season 2 Bo-Katan and Darksaber video. I'll explain what's going on with them on the series. Katie Sackhoff also clarified some things in a recent interview that she did about what's going on with the future of her character. I'm doing videos for all the episodes, so if you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all those, and we'll do a giveaway for Disney Plus memberships. All you have to do to enter is be a subscriber and post all your theories about Bo-Katan and the Darksaber on the video. Careful for spoilers for everything that's happened on The Mandalorian so far, I'll just number these as we go along to stay organized. Starting with number 10, Bo-Katan tells The Mandalorian that she's changing the deal, Darth Vader style, Big Empire Strikes Back reference, pray I don't alter it further, this is the way. Because she did need the weapons Moff Gideon was buying in order to arm her divisions of Mandalorians that she explains so she could eventually retake Mandalore from all of his forces. But in order to actually be able to rule the Mandalorian people effectively, she also needed something special. That thing, of course, was the Darksaber because they're incorporating more canon from the Star Wars Clone Wars and Rebels series, and she literally shouts it out later in the episode. The Darksaber has been a relatively recent addition to the Star Wars canon in the last 10 years or so, but within the Mandalorian culture, it's been used as a symbol of leadership for a thousand years. So for her to truly become the new Mandalore, the leader of their reunified people because they're scattered right now, she needs to have it for all to see. It's like being a king or queen without a crown. You might be a leader, but most of the people won't really recognize or respect you without all the flair and the trappings of kings and queens. And for Mandalorians, that just means swinging around the Darksaber. Number nine, that's why her older sister, Duchess Satine Kreese, had trouble leading the Mandalorians during the Clone Wars. She was more of a pacifist and wanted to take her people away from their militaristic ways, which did not sit well with a lot of the traditionalist factions within their people. They're a very warlike culture historically, and when Bo-Katan told Mando that he was a child of the Watch, the Death Watch, like in the flashback, we saw him get rescued by the Death Watch Mandalorians from the Clone Wars. Their group was an extreme example of a growing sentiment in the Mandalorian culture that they should return to the old ways of their people and become conquerors again. The way they explain Death Watch on the series here is that they're sort of like this crazy religious cult. The Death Watch of the Clone Wars wasn't quite so crazy, but Duchess Satine did not have the Darksaber. Pre Vizsla, Jon Favreau's character did. He was the leader of the Death Watch. He was also a direct descendant of one of the original leaders of their people, Mandalore the Great, the one they keep referring to during Season 1. The original Mandalorian Jedi who created the Darksaber in the first place, then came back to lead his people. His name was Tar Vizsla. He died about a thousand years ago, so he never knew original Yoda, just sort of charting big moments in the timeline. Yoda was about 900 years old when he died, so he didn't come along till a little bit later. But him having the pedigree in the Darksaber heavily undermined Duchess Satine's efforts at peace with the Republic and Jedi. Number eight, Bo-Katan herself was briefly a member of the Death Watch, but before that she created the Night Owls with Satine. That's why they have those white owl symbols on their armor here. They were originally just meant to be an elite group of female warriors, but one of the reasons why Bo-Katan joined Pre Vizsla in Death Watch was because at the time, part of her believed his way, the old way, might be better, at least for a time until she realized how crazy he was and starting to get, and then he was killed by Darth Maul, who then hijacked the Darksaber, their group, and tried to take over the entire planet. Number seven, she also mentions at the end of the episode as she's interrogating Titus Welliver's captain character. They didn't really give him an actual name in the episode. They just call him the captain in the credits. She asks him if he has the Darksaber. He activated his own personal kill switch there, so to speak, to prevent Bo-Katan from forcing him to take her directly to Moff Gideon. But obviously that's who they were talking about. Everyone saw him with the Darksaber at the end of season one, episode eight, cutting himself out of the TIE Outlander. And just before this scene, he showed up on the comms, ordering the captain and his men to destroy the shipment of weapons. Number six, Katie Sackhoff did a bunch of interviews in the past week after episode three aired, talking about how she became live action Bo-Katan. She actually said that it was harder to do the live action version after having done the voice of animated Bo-Katan, just because she wanted to get it so perfect and so accurate to the animated version. She said that she didn't have any scenes with Ahsoka this season, but that she hopes to have some scenes with her in future seasons, just sort of confirming what's going to be happening with Ahsoka this season. 
She also says that when she was developing the live-action version, she had long conversations with Jon Favreau and Dave Filoni about Bo-Katan's history between the Clone Wars Rebels when she shows up here in Episode 3 years later and what their plans were for her live-action version in the future of the Mandalorian series and the Star Wars universe in general. She did kind of address some of the spin-off rumors, too. I'll explain that at the end of the video. But yes, of course, it should go without saying that she's going to come back in future episodes. Number five, more importantly, she also said that they will reveal how Moff Gideon actually got the Darksaber from her during the season two episodes. We won't have to wait till season three to find that out. We haven't seen much of Moff Gideon during season two so far. Episode four this week is going to be the halfway point this season, so it just confirms there'll be a ton more Moff Gideon in the back half. Giancarlo Esposito said that he broke a ton of the Darksaber props on set while they were filming lightsaber fight scenes. The Darksaber is just a different type of specialized lightsaber, to be clear. Darksaber is just what everyone calls it because of the Black Blade. That obviously implies he's going to be chopping his way through at least a couple people in close combat, and we might actually get to see Bo-Katan come within arm's reach of the Darksaber during Season 2. But based on the way Giancarlo Esposito talked about his story during this season in his interviews, it doesn't sound like anyone is going to be able to take the Darksaber from him, at least this season. Future seasons, for sure. That's the whole arc of the series. The Mandalorians eventually reclaiming their planet from him and everything that he stole from them. Number four, originally Bo-Katan was given the Darksaber by Sabine Wren during Star Wars Rebels so that she could unify the remaining Mandalorian clans under a single banner, just as Emperor Palpatine and the Empire were finishing their conquest of the galaxy. This is all during the rise of the Empire, taking place about a year before the events of A New Hope in the original trilogy of movies. After this, the only thing we know of her character is that she fights in the Great Purge, loses the Darksaber to Moff Gideon somehow, which they'll explain during Season 2 episodes. Then she and the Night Owls become pirates, so to speak, gathering weapons to arm their scattered Mandalorian people and mount a new war to retake the planet. Then she shows up in Episode 3 where we saw her. They won't completely cover her entire history during that missing period of the original trilogy during Season 2, but like she said, they will explain how Moff Gideon got the Darksaber. The rest of that history they'll probably slowly dole out in future seasons when she comes back or appears in potential spin-off series. When she talked about the potential spin-off series that she would show up on, she just gave the standard blanket, I don't know what you're talking about, spin-off series, but obviously the Disney CEO said that they were developing spin-off series from The Mandalorian. Number three, before Bo-Katan had the Darksaber, the first time it appeared was during the Clone Wars Season 2. Jon Favreau played a character called Pre Vizsla that I've talked about a bunch during my videos. The reason why he came to the series, Jon Favreau, was because he was finishing editing on the first Iron Man movie back in 2007 at Skywalker Ranch, while at the same time, Dave Filoni was working on the Clone Wars. They became friends in real life. Eventually, Dave Filoni says, why don't you come play a character on my TV show, The Clone Wars? So they created Pre Vizsla for him. But because he was going to be facing off against Obi-Wan, the Jedi, Duchess Satine, they wanted to give him something that would make him just as badass as a potential Jedi. So Dave Filoni and George Lucas created the concept of the Darksaber, and that's where you see it show up in this episode here. He was eventually killed by Darth Maul, who then took the Darksaber, wielded it for a while. Then Maul took the Darksaber to Dathomir, where it rested till Star Wars Rebels. When they grabbed it back, Sabine got it then, and then eventually she gave it to Bo-Katan. Sam Witwer, the voice of Darth Maul, also has been posting a bunch of memes on Twitter, just joking about the Darksaber. I don't know where this came from. This belongs to me. It was stolen out of my bedroom. There are so many different characters that he could play in these live action series. He himself could be a version of Starkiller. He could also come back as the voice of Darth Maul during the Obi-Wan series, as has been rumored. But number two, when Bo-Katan was talking about retaking Mandalore, that was what she was referring to when she said that they were taking the entire ship, not just the weapons. We'll need this in the battles to come. That sounds like a teaser for something further off in future seasons. There'll definitely be a big battle before the season two finale, but she's talking about this grand war to retake the entire planet. And that's a classic Star Wars style giant space battle. Way too big for a single episode. So early prediction, the battle for Mandalore, or the new battle for Mandalore, will be something that they spread out over the course of the entire final season of the show, or final seasons, multiple, whatever those wind up being. Season 4, season 5, season 7, I would love to see the Mandalorian series go for 7 seasons. And as the Disney CEO said, they were developing multiple Mandalorian spin-off series with different characters. That new galactic level war for Mandalore would probably cross over into the plots of those other series as well. 
Number one, it should be said that The Mandalorian will always be the main series no matter how many spin-off series they do. It's like Game of Thrones. They slowly build to the war with the White Walkers, the final seasons, an eventual final battle for King's Landing, the Iron Throne. Now we're just talking about the Beskar Iron Throne of Mandalore. You just have to have faith that Dave Filoni and Jon Favreau are way better at adapting that story than the Game of Thrones showrunners. So odds are pretty good that everyone will be way happier with how they decide to tell this full story. As for the Mandalorian himself getting caught up in this giant galactic war, he's the classic trope of the reluctant hero, not wanting to get involved in her war to retake the planet. No, I have this mission, this child, I have to take him back to the Jedi. So he's doing everything he can to avoid getting involved in these bigger conflicts, but will inevitably find himself inspired to join the fight for a number of reasons, most notably because, early prediction, Moff Gideon will probably be able to capture Baby Yoda, maybe with a little bit of help from Boba Fett, and when he tries to rescue him in Season 3, he'll need all of the help he can get, help that Bo-Katan and the Night Owls, the other Mandalorians, can give him thus making him a bigger part in their fight against Moff Gideon, because Bo-Katan also wants to get rid of Moff Gideon in a much bigger way, so they both have beef with him, so it's just another reason for them to team up again. But everyone, post all your theories in the comments below. My full Mandalorian Season 2 Episode 4 video will post Friday, just like normal. And congratulations to the giveaway winner for my last big Star Wars video, Matthew Russell. Please email me on the About page of my channel so I can get your contact details. Everyone click here for my brand new Mandalorian Season 2 Ahsoka Tano scene breakdown and click here for my full Mandalorian Season 2 Episode 3 video. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe. This is the way.